<laughs> All right. Well, happy Mother's Day to you mothers. Yay. And uh, to have a special Mother's Day message today. I don't give titles to my message, but if I did, this one would be called Do Not Love the World. So here we go. The good old apostle of love is at it again, challenging us Christians to live in a way that is pleasing to God. And we are going to be in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 uh, this morning. Last week, we talked about the joy of simply walking with Jesus and how our relationship with him needs to be our priority. That the Apostle Paul's phrase from Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, shouldn't just be a statement in our lives, but should be our anthem in life. That nothing would ever become more important than knowing Jesus and growing closer and closer to him. Amen? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and they, that they may have it more abundantly. That's the life he wants for us. Abundantly means greater it means over and above. It, it even means extraordinary. I mean, that sounds good, right? To have an extraordinary life. Does anyone want an extraordinary life? Well, the answer to the extraordinary life is to come to Jesus. It's to stay close to him and place him as number one of our lives. Now, does that mean things for us become problem-free without any difficulty? That we come to Jesus and we get the easy-peasy, lemon-squeezy kind of life? No. But life can be abundant, in him. It could be full, greater than anything imaginable, because we have the one who made and sustains all things, su sustaining us and working on our behalf. It can be extraordinary. Amen? And yet, it is important for us to know there are hindrances to this extraordinary life with our Savior. And John focuses on one of those things this morning that is trying to distract us from our pursuit of the Lord, the world. The world and our, desi and our desire to seek fulfillment through it. But as we'll see, living for the pleasures of this world will never satisfy and bring the extraordinary life. Again, only Jesus will. So let's get into it. Let's see what John has for us this morning. Read with me verses 15 through 17 of 1 John chapter 2. The Apostle of Love writes this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Or another translation says, lives forever. The extraordinary life forever. <laughs> Lord, we thank you so much for today. We ask that you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, this is, this is deep stuff. This is real stuff that we cover. But your word it never returns void. And I pray even this morning that, that as you do challenge us, as you do just want to grab hold of our hearts, that we would allow you to work and rule and reign in us. God, we want to live for you. We want to experience you to the fullest extent possible. And we know that's when true life comes. So would you do a work today, Lord, we pray. We love you. We invite you to work. In Jesus' name, amen. There are two key words here in, in this important section, the word love which is used three times in verse 15, and world, which is used six times total in these three verses. First, love. You know, already in the epistle, John has expressed the necessity for us Christians to be full of love, but here he wants to make sure that love is not misapplied or misdirected. And even as we begin, I believe we need to define the term love here to understand what John means, because us American English speakers, we use the term love to describe our fondness for a vast amount of things. From the most superficial of things all the way to the most significant, meaningful things in life, we say, I love, don't we? I'm sure you know what I mean. For me, when I talk about the strong affection I have for my wife, who's beautiful, <laughs> gorgeous, okay, and my three boys, I use the word love. But I do also find myself use love when I talk about the, the best baseball team on the planet, which is the Dodgers, right? <laughs> Or the perfectly cooked, deep-fried, luscious, sugary taste of Randy's apple fritter. I use the word love to describe them. I use the word to describe both. But obviously, even though I do say I love the Dodgers and love Randy's donuts, my love for them, which is a lot, does not come close to the love I have for my family. But I still use that same word, love. Well, unlike our word love that is used for a lot, probably too much, in the Greek, there are different words for love that carry specific meanings. And the word John uses here for love is the creme de la creme. It is the top dog, it is the pinnacle of all loves. It's the word agape. 
And agape means, it speaks of a love that is full of strength and devotion. It's a love that carries the deepest level of loyalty and commitment. And John will use this word agape throughout his epistle for what we should be loving, but here he directs, directly tells us what we should not be loving. And that is the world. Phrase numero uno, 1 John 2.15, do not love the world. Now wait, 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 Justin. Hold on, just one sec. Do not love the world. Didn't Jesus say in John 3.16, and we sang it this morning, the most popular verse, I know, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. What's going on? God loves the world, but is telling me not to love it. Is God making a, par a parenting, you know, do what I say, not what I do statement right here? That it's okay for you to do it, me to do it, but you can't do it. Let me first say no. That's not what God is doing. Do what I say, what I, not a command like that. Our goal in life is to be more like God and do what he does. But what is happening here, John 2 verse 15, is John is not talking about the same love as John 3 16. You know, even though this word for, for world in, in the Greek is the, the same word in both passages, it does carry a different meaning in each. And what determines the, the, that meaning is the context of where it is. You know, sometimes the world will refer to the material world, the earth where we live, all we see, all of God's beautiful creation. While sometimes the world means the human world, which consists of all mankind, people of the world. That def second definition would be the meaning behind John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It obviously does not mean that God so loved creation. <laughs> the mountains and rivers and the beaches, like ones we live by, that, that Jesus came and died. I mean, I know some extreme environmentalists might like that to be the case, but that's not the case. No, God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son that whoever, the context, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The meaning of the word there is not the physical world, but people, that's the context. Well, which one does John mean here? Well, before you answer out loud, it's a trick question. Neither. <laughs> here, when John says, do not love the world, he is not referring to the world of creation, nor is he talking about the world of John 3.16, the world that is made up of all mankind. There is another understanding for world, and the context here reveals this third meaning speaks of a worldly system. That is, the, uh, that is this unseen evil spiritual system that stands completely opposed to God. This world is summed up by verse 16 where it states that this world is all about lust and pride, and it says there at the end, is not of the Father. What that means is this world system not only leaves God out, but is hostile towards everything he says is right and true. It centers on all that is against God and against all that God has given to us to believe in his word. It's a system we live in today. Yay! But the reason that it's fully opposed to God is because it's headed up by Satan himself, who is called by Jesus in John 12, 31, the ruler of this world. Satan is pure evil, he rebelled against God and now is the one behind the scenes causing all the problems and unrighteousness that we are physically seeing in our world today. The Bible calls Satan a liar, a deceiver, and a murderer. Satan is a real foe. His very name means adversary. He is full of hate and longs to destroy lives, especially the lives of Christians who are seeking to follow and honor the Lord here on this planet. And it's really not hard. It's not hard to see how he has led this world and culture away from God and truth through deception and enticement in all avenues of life. I mean, we see it from secular ideologies and philosophies to politics to education to science to even cultic and false religions, which I believe would be the worst as it falsely claims that there can be salvation and satisfaction outside of the true Jesus found in the Bible. Satan's world system has corrupted values, it's brought confusion and ungodly perspectives as it blinds people from seeing their need for God and all that he has deemed right and true. And people of the world have bought into it. it they bought into its agenda and are seeking to find fulfillment here in life instead of in God. The world, John brings up, is completely destructive. And all of us who are believers now, we know what it's all about because we once lived for this world system. We know about ungodly agendas and worldviews because we had them. We also know about the selfish ambitions, sinful pleasures, and pursuits in life outside of Christ because we lived them. 
We know that a life of sin was maybe fun for a season, maybe a long season, but it could never satisfy. It could never bring full joy to our lives. Only Jesus could, and that's why I believe you're sitting here today. (laughs) Because you know that this world has nothing to offer. But even for us Christians, it's still easy to be enticed into thinking this world has something to offer us. Where we forget about the bondage living for this world brought as we can be tempted to turn back to it. You know, it reminds me of the children of Israel. When they thought back about their life in Egypt, though they had God presently working miraculously in their midst, in their lives, as they witnessed him defeat their enemies, as they had him providing bread from heaven daily, they even had his presence with them as a cloud by day and a pillar by fire. They literally saw that God was right there with them, even though they had that. When they thought back at Egypt, what did they say? They said, in Egypt, we had fish. And cucumbers. Who likes cucumbers? Melons and leeks and onions. I do love onions. Garlic. Some of you like garlic too much. He says, but they said, we ate freely. So we ate freely at no cost. No cost? What? You were slaves in Egypt. You were in bondage. Your lives were the payment for the things that you ate. You know, Egypt is a spiritual representation of the world for us Christians, and what this world system has to offer us is exactly what Egypt offered the children of Israel, bondage. Oh, but it tastes so yummy. (laughs) It's so freeing. It feels so good for a season, maybe your whole life, but it's temporary. As we'll see, it's fading. Living for this world only leads to destruction and bondage and will hinder that strong, extraordinary spiritual life that Jesus has for us. So John is saying, Christian, do not love this world system and all that it's offering you, and if you are, you need to stop. And you need to get back on track because this world system will enslave and destroy you. John then adds to it, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Another, wait, what? Maybe you read that and you're like, oh great, my family is in this world. My friends are here. My dog is here. My career is here. My favorite vacation spot is here. My hobbies are here. My house that I worked so hard to finally afford to buy is here. Or if you're like me, the Dodgers are here. Randy's Donuts are here. Or my sunburst J45 Gibson guitar is here. What what about these things? What does it mean to not love the things in this world? Does it mean I have to forsake everyone I know and everything I own, become a monk on a mountain, and isolate myself away from all earthly pleasures until I die? That's a little dramatic, Justin, but no, that's not what John has in mind. And he will detail what those specific things of the world are in the next verse, but I believe it's worth briefly mentioning when it comes to possessions and relationships and activities in life, we Christians can have and enjoy these things. We should. God wants us to. He wants us to enjoy them. But it's important for us to place things in the right order and keep things in the right balance with God on top. Because once things get out of order in our lives and out of balance, that's when we find ourselves in trouble and passionately loving this world instead of God. Let me say it this way. It's, it's okay to have possessions as long as possessions don't have you. It's okay to love your career as long as it doesn't become your place of worship. And it's okay, it's good, great even, to have earthly relationships, but none of them can surpass your relationship with your heavenly Father. And we should always check. We should always do a self-check and evaluation in our hearts to make sure we are not allowing anything, anything to come in front of God. Which is why Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. God must be first. And God, he will bless us with things. I am so blessed. I am blessed by my family. I am blessed by the things he's given me. I'm blessed by these relationships I have here. How I feel closer to you than I do some of my own family members. I'm blessed like that with people and things. But but God needs to come first. And our relationship and desire to pursue him must be our top priority always. To know him. That I may know him. And this goes right along with John's next sentence in the second part of verse 15 where he says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If we are are living for this world or the balance of things is out of whack, so will our spiritual life be. We need to place God first and love him above all other things. But I think it's important for us to know, too, that loving God also means loving what he loves. And that is not ever the ways of this world. You know, I always love this, this quote by Augustine or Augustine where it says, where he wrote, love God and do whatever you please. And I used to quote it, love God and do whatever you want. That's what we gotta do. 
And, and, and that, that statement is true, and that's where we, I, we, I've stopped it and, and I've quoted it. But, and it's true. If you're loving God with everything, putting him first, then things will fall into place. Then things will be in the right balance, in the right order. That you're loving God, you will do things that are honoring of him. That makes sense. But, that, but that's not where the quote stops. That would be awesome if it's just there and, and things would fall into play. But, but this is how the full quote goes. August, Augustine said, Love God and do whatever you please. For the soul trained in love to God will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved. I mean, I think that fits perfectly into what John is saying. When we love God first, not only will things fit into a proper place, but so will we. Uh, when we love God first, our perspective will be biblical. When we love God first, our appetites for righteousness and holiness and purity will increase as we turn our hearts completely over to him. Jesus said this in John 14, 15. He says, if you l love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said that. If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, do those things that are pleasing to me. If you love me, keep my commandments. What do we think? We look at that and we go, to-do list and a not-to-do list. That's what it's about. I can do this as a Christian. I can't do that as a Christian. And to some extent, that's true. God has given us things that are right and things that are wrong for us to do and not to do. But John will say at the end of his letter, his commandments are not burdensome, which means they're not difficult. Following his commandments are actually easy if you're loving God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, with everything in you. You can do those things. And, and, and you can because if you're truly loving God, he will be working in your hearts, changing us from the inside out. He'll be creating new desires in us that will be pleasing to him. And you guys have seen it. I mean, look, I mean, who comes to church on Sunday? Who wants to be here? You could be eating IHOP. You could be sleeping. You could be watching some sporting event, whatever's on right now. Is that just playing yet? I don't know if they're playing yet. You could be doing that, but you're here. And why? Because you have a desire. You have a desire for God. You have a priority to him. And, and you, you love to be in God's word together. You love it. You know you're going to be fed. You love to, as a body, as a spiritual experience, worship him because he deserves all your praise. And that you know that there's something uh, amazing when you gather together and do it. And then when you're around the body of Christ and you go, wow, I, you know, I know that they, 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 they're not the same age as me. They don't have the same background as me. They don't have the same experiences. But you know what I have? When I'm with them, I have Jesus. And it's so different than the people in this world. Yes, we might see things a little different here and there. But we have Jesus connecting us together. And you're like, yes. And you know what else? You, you'll want to live a life that pleases him. Practical holy living becomes priority to your life as well. If you're loving God with everything, you will want to live the practical, holy life. But on the flip side, if we neglect the call of God uh, to place God first, then we will be pulled towards this world and our hunger for the ungodly things of this world will grow over our desire for God. If we're loving the things of this world more than God, that's where we're going to be pulled. And because of this, John passionately tells us not to give this world system any devotion at all, as he now tells us the world, what the world system is all about. Verse 16, he says, For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and notice super important, is not of the Father, but, it, but is of the world. God is not in any of these things. We cannot blame God and say, oh, he's giving me this desire to, to lust after this thing. If it's against God's word, it's not from God. God does not approve of these pursuits and sinful practices, but he wants us to stay clear of them. And this world will bring harm to us every time we give into these these things that are listed, which I think could be summarized this way. The lust of the flesh, me. The lust of the eyes, myself. The, the pride of life, I. Me, myself, and I. This is what the philosophy of this world is all about. If it feels good, do it. If you could get ahead, go for it. It's all about what make, makes you happy. It doesn't matter. There's no standard. There's no morality standard. Whatever makes you happy, you do it. It's all about you. And of course, we Christians know that God has called us to be so different than those in this world. They will justify lifestyles. They will behave unbiblically and live to satisfy all their sinful desires. But we are called to deny ourselves and live those set-apart lives unto him, resisting these very temptations. And the first worldly force, temptation, John brings up is the lust of the flesh. And the term flesh is not meaning our physical bodies that are flesh and blood. That as I look out at you, I see flesh. I see, I see bodies in front of me. You see a body in front of you. It's not that. The term flesh speaks of the desires of our fallen nature that yearns to fulfill sinful pleasures. 
I just want to say it again. This term flesh speaks of the desires of our fallen nature that yearns to fulfill sinful pleasures. That's what is specifically meant by the lust of the flesh. The word lust means exactly what you think it means. It means lust. It means longing. It means craving. It means to desire. But fleshly desires are never directed towards anything good or godly ever. No, the flesh only lusts for the things that are impure and ungodly. And when we think of lusting after the flesh, we tend to think of it in terms of inappropriate sexual desires, which is true, but it can mean so much more. You know, Galatians 5, 19 through 21 defines and brings total clarity to what, the, what fulfilling of the lust of the flesh is. And this is what it says. It says that the lust of the flesh, what they um, consist of, number one, starts with sexual things, adultery. On that list, top thing, adultery, lust of the flesh. That is the deed of the flesh. Fornication. Fornication is any sex outside of God's design of marriage. Uncleanness, which, you know, is not just being dirty. Uncleanness speaks of, of pornography to dirty language and speech. That's flesh. That's fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Lewdness, sensuality, being seductive. That's, those are sexual sins he starts with. And then Paul goes on and says, idolatry. And idolatry is not necessarily worshiping a, a physical statue, bowing down to it, but idolatry is putting anything before God. And what we talked about earlier, if the balance is wrong, it could be idolatry. That means people, possessions, pursuits can be idolatry. It's not just a statue. He says sorcery, which is not just wit, uh, witchcraft and those kind of things, but sorcery means drugs for pleasure, which is something that's running rampant in our culture today, drugs for pleasure. It, it, it goes and adds hatred do you think that hatred is part of the flesh? But they hate us. They're coming against us. They hate me. It's the flesh. If we respond in, in, the, in flesh, we don't fight the flesh. We don't fight flesh with flesh. We fight it in the spirit. And, and hatred and contentions it adds is fighting. Jealousies, that's what takes place inside. You look over and you want what they have. Outbursts of wrath, he adds. Selfish ambition, dissensions, which is divisions. We're seeing that in our world today. Like, I think never before in my lifetime. Heresy, speaking against God. Envy, wanting thou, desiring, coveting those things that are not yours. Murders. And we know that the Bible teaches that murder is not just done physically on the outward. We can murder someone in our heart with hate. It adds drunkenness to that. Sometimes we like to get, skip that over. Drunkenness. Drunkenness is part of the flesh. Lust of the flesh, giving into the flesh. Revelries, which mean wild parties. And then he concludes by saying, and the like. You know what and the like means? That means anything along these lines. That means that anything that you are battling with, anything that you give into that you know is not of God, fits into that. And is the flesh. Lusting after the flesh sure covers a lot. This is what the world is drawing us toward, and its power is strong, even for us Christians. You know, once we come to Jesus, it, it doesn't mean our past desires to give into these things cease. That we can start walking with the Lord and poof, all our struggles are gone. No temptations. No, I think the temptations come more and more. Because they're trying to pull us back into the world. But unlike the world, we are new creations in Christ. And in him, we also have the ability to bear good fruit. That's what he goes on to say after the works of the flesh. The fruit of the Spirit, which is defined for us in Galatians 5 as, as love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Are these things coming out of your life? Or No. Or is it the flesh? Are you living after the ways of the flesh? You know, our lives don't have to be full of flesh spewing. They can be full of blossoming, sweet, beautiful flowers, <laughs> spiritually speaking, these, these, these fruit of the Spirit. But the only way these characteristics come is by abiding in Christ, literally choosing to yield to the Holy Spirit instead of our fleshly desires. You know, in that same chapter, Galatians 5, we learn that there is this war that's taking place between our flesh and the Spirit, our old nature and our new, who we used to be, and who we are now in Christ. And I almost hear the boxing bell go ding, 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 ding. In this corner, here's Justin, old Justin, who lived for this, desired this, went for this. But in this corner, it's a spiritual Justin who wants to live to please God. I mean, I, I know it's weird, but I think that fits. I think that's what's happening. That's what I can envision. An intense boxing match between spirit and flesh. And it's real. Because these th two things are totally opposed to one another. It, and it's a fight. It's a battle. You guys know what I'm talking about. If you are in Christ, the battle is real. But what we need to know as Christians is God has given us all that we need to overcome and not give in to the flesh. 
You know, God, through the power of his Holy Spirit and the enlightenment of his word, has given us all that we need to have victory over sin. This is the part of the new creation life. You know, before we were believers, we were in bondage to sin, but not anymore. Now we have all we need to choose what is right and to live for God. If that was not the case, John would not have said it. He would not, would not have said, stop loving and giving into the ways of the world. He wouldn't have said that. If it wasn't possible for us to do it, he would have said, oh, well, have fun, good luck. He didn't say that, or neither did Paul. Paul would not have said, we can walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They both said it because we can. We can overcome those things. We can choose what is right. We have all that we need to embrace the, the practical, holy life that God has for us. Will we be perfect? No, but we'll be empowered and fully capable to move forward and grow stronger in the Lord. And if we are loving God with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength, yielding to the spirit in our lives, this is exactly what will happen. We will be strong spiritually and good fruit will be produced, not the works of the flesh. And that's when life will be spiritually extraordinary and satisfying and fulfilling, which is so much better. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, uh, someone testify with me. To, to live this life and not walk in guilt and shame and, and know that nothing is grabbing hold of you. Will you stumble? Yes, you'll stumble. But to know that, that, that you're not chained up any longer. That, that, that you have the freedom in Christ. You, you have the freedom to live the life that Jesus died to give you. You know, the world looks at us and they say, bondage. They go, you, you guys go to church. You have to go to church. You have to read your Bible. You have to pray. You have to hang out with those weird other people. That's what you have to do. No, that's what we get to do. We get to do that. And you know what? We desire those things because God has changed our lives. And it's so much better. You know, more than half my life now, I've been a Christian than before in the world. And I, I, I can tell you, the life now in Christ is so much satisfying, more satisfying than anything I experienced in this world. It's so much richer, it's so much fuller, it's so much, ex much more extraordinary than anything I experienced in the past. And it's more fun. I mean, I'm still, I'm having, in the midst of this crazy world, it's like, we could have fun, like we could get together, we could worship, we could sing, we could laugh. Man, the Bible even talks about laughter being a good medicine, right? Man, we need to laugh a little bit. Especially you. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> but loving Jesus, living for him is, is so much better. I need an amen to that today. Amen. We don't have to give in to the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life, like John adds there in verse 16, as these all go together. The lust of the, the eyes is what excites and ignites the flesh. There's a saying that, that is said out there is the eyes are the window to the soul. You hear that phrase before? And I think that means by looking into someone's eyes, you can understand who they are. You can understand what makes them tick, their emotions, something along those lines. Well, I think there can be another better definition. Okay, a biblical definition uh, uh, to the eyes being the window of the soul. And that would be defined as this. What we set our eyes on will have a direct effect on our soul. If our eyes are focused on the Lord and the things that please him, our soul will be healthy and our soul will be strong. But if they are, are set on the things of this world, our soul will become worldly and spiritually sick. You know, the lust of the eyes, it, it can also speak of coveting and envying what is not yours. And, and that, that could be power, it could be possessions, and it could be even be people. You know, when you look over, see something that doesn't belong to you, and you so crave it, you, you are willing to take matters into your own hands to acquire it. I mean, that's, that's what, uh, what happened with David, right? When he desired Bathsheba. We, we're familiar with the story. David went on the roof as he was supposed to be out to war, as kings did in those days, but he stayed back. And he, and, he, and he went on the roof. And when he went on the roof, he saw this beautiful lady bathing. And it says he was enticed by her. But instead of stopping himself, instead of holding the thoughts captive and turning to the Lord for strength, we are told that David inquired about her. And, and, and he even sent messengers to get her. And as he acquired of her, would he not have learned that she had a husband? But he still, he still had the messengers bring her to him. And we all know the story, which, which led to enormous sins. First was adultery with her. And adultery, that led to the murder of Bathsheba's husband Uriah. But it didn't stop there. It also led to heartache for David himself. As a child that was conceived in that adulterous affair died shortly after birth. Just like pursuing the lust of the flesh will only lead to destruction and pain spiritually, so will the lust of the eyes. Which is why Job made a covenant with his eyes not to look at young women because he knew the destruction lusting after women could bring. And his wife was no prize. <laughs> you remember. <laughs> Looks at him, 
all messed up and boils and whatever he's got going, lust, lose, just curse God and die. What a great supportive wife. I'm so glad my wife is not like that. We have our moments, but it's never like that. <laughs> but, but he was godly, and he didn't want to go down a path of destruction. You know, I was, uh, a while back now, I was talking to a married man who's not part of our church, so don't try and seek it out, who said, you know, it's, it's okay to look at the ladies, but not touch. No, it's not. It's not. It'll lead you down a path that's, that's destructive. That's why Jesus said, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And we are to take this serious. I think all of us in that way. It's so easy to access things now that will lead us down a path of destruction. We need to take extreme measures. We're to take it serious and, and not, not, not think that looking or simply desiring anything, it could be a person, but it could be a position or a possession. We think that it's harmless. It's not harmless to covet those things that are not yours, that God has not brought into your life. If every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, then we need to, to embrace the gifts that he's given us, not something that belongs to someone else. Because having lustful eyes will lead to more. It will entice the flesh and further tempt us to give into the flesh as we said, the flesh is strong. And sometimes we lose that battle. It begins a war. But John also adds the pride of life to this list. And this could speak about materialism and acquiring all one can so they can look back in their life and look and say, yeah, look what I did. You know, when it comes to me competing against that other person, I was so much more successful. I mean, it could mean that as, as it definitely is worldly thinking and being arrogant and haughty is, the, is what the word pride means in that passage. But I believe the pride of life can mean something much more dangerous. And that is the belief you can make it in this life without God. That all I need is me, myself, and I. And I can do it all on my own. I am self-sufficient. You know, that self-elevating pride is destructive as it removes us from the full dependence and trust in the Lord. And we Christians, we need to know, understand this, we need to fully depend upon the Lord always always from salvation to our personal lives now as we're walking with him, I think in all eternity we have to depend on him. That's what we're called to do is trust him and depend on him. But wasn't this kind of pride true of Satan himself? This, this king that we're talking about of the world, this, this ruler of the world? In Isaiah 14, we read of what caused his downfall, and that was when he said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, is what he said. I don't need God, because I can be my own God. You know, for Satan, it was I, 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 me, 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 me. And God said, I don't think so. And Satan was cast down to this world where he's still full of pride, but he's also roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may, may devour, as he is deceiving and blinding people and leading people astray by enticing them through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But may we not buy into it, <laughs> but instead resist his tactics. You know, these tactics are what John says are true now, but these are Satan's tactics from all eternity past, from all past. This is, the, this is the same strategy he uses. You know, quite a few brilliant commentators have noted a couple times in Scripture where Satan has used these very same schemes to try and take people out. One time he was successful, and one time he failed miserably. The first was, he was successful, was with Eve in Genesis chapter 3. And we are familiar with the story. We all know it's ancestors, made a boo-boo, made a mistake, still feeling the effects of that today the whole apple fruit situation. But what happened after she was tempted by slithering Satan, this is what we read in Genesis 3, 6. It says, so when the woman saw the, tr the forbidden tree, that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. You see that? I will make it all make sense right here. Eve gave in to sin when she saw that the tree was, one, good for food. It would satisfy her flesh the lust of the flesh. Number two, it was pleasant to the eyes. It would entice her by the lust of the eyes. And number three, it was desirable to make her wise, the pride of life, to have vast knowledge, to be like the most high. I can be like God. You know, Satan won that day using his three-tier temptation strategy, and we're still facing the effects today. 
But, but Satan also tried it again with someone else and failed. And I think we know who that would be. It's with the Lord, Jesus himself. It was in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was led into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry and then slithering Satan t- came to tempt him three times. Number one was the flesh. As food could satisfy his hunger, Satan told Jesus to give in and turn the stones into bread. Jesus didn't do that. So a second attempt was made. When Satan took Jesus up high to the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And because you have charge over the angels, the position of power, they will catch you. He appealed to, his, to the pride of life. This is your position. This is who you are. You can do it. So do it. Throw yourself down and watch those who are subjected to you carry you to safety. But when that didn't work, temptation number three came. Satan took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms, kingdoms of the world and their glory, which would be appealing to the eyes for sure. And of course, Satan added, all you have to do is bow down to me and worship me and you can have all this. But side note, this shows us Satan does really have this world. That it's his system. If he was able to offer it to Jesus, which mean, that means it's his. It was his to give. He could do it. But we know what happened. After that moment, Jesus said, away with you, Satan. And the devil left him. Satan uses the same schemes today that he uses back then. But like Jesus and not Eve, we can resist his temptations. Well, Justin, that was Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Believe me, I know you're not Jesus. (laughs) And you know that I'm not Jesus. But Jesus promises to be with us every step of the way. And like we said earlier, he has given us all we need to overcome, which is this. And his Holy Spirit, which were the very same tools Jesus had when he was tempted in the wilderness. Before the temptation, we are told it was the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness. And Jesus combated each attack from the enemy with the word of God. We know that. Through the temptation of the flesh, Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in tempting him to give in to pride, it is written, Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And through the temptation of the eyes, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Put him first. God has given us all that we need. All that we need to walk strong in him. To overcome temptations, all the temptations that are thrown at us. He has given us his Holy Spirit who resides in us and he's given us the truth that we are to follow and not give in to. Even if the world says something completely different. We just need to choose to do it. Choose the things of the Lord, the things that bring life, that grow and mature us and keep us close to Jesus. And so the exhortation for us today is be on guard. Be equipped. And don't give in to to the lie that this world has anything to offer because it doesn't. Only Jesus does, amen? Amen. And this is ultimately what he closes with in verse 17. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. I don't know about you, if you notice this or not, but, but things on this planet, they don't seem to be doing so well. <laughs> I mean, and, and those of you who are going with us through the book of Re- Revelation, you, we know that things are going to get worse and worse. But you look at this world, and we think, what do they got? What do they got? How's it working out for them? It's not. And guess what? It's fading. The lust of this world, the identity that they're trying to find here in whatever avenue they're trying to find in, it's going to fade. And God has called us to find all of our hope, all of our identity in him. And when we do, that's when there can be joy. That's when there can be peace. That's when we, we know no matter what comes our way that we have God working right there with us. I mean, this world is fading away, but you know what's not? <laughs> Where our citizenship truly lies. It's not fading away. It's promised to us. We need to ho- grab hold of that. Yes, we're here in this world now, but our citizenship is there with him in heaven. And he has this place for us. And I I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for that day that he takes these 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 heavy tears that I have daily now and he just he just he just wipes them away. And the heartache, the heart, the pain, the the heaviness of my heart for my mistakes, for the things that I've gone through, is is lifted. That he's the strength of my heart, that he he lifts it up. That's what's coming. This world's not going to offer it to us. And what it's going to do is pull us away. It's pull us away from truly experiencing all that he has for us right now, which is abundance. Extraordinary. Do you have that? Well, you, you will have it even more if you do what he's telling us to do here. Don't love this world. I think that the opposite is meant. Love God. Put him first. 
Stay centered and focused on him in your life and watch what he does. He'll do great and awesome things. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for this day. Lord, help us to set our mind on things above. Help us to know that you're with us. Lord, help us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to you every day. Lord, knowing that that's our reasonable service to you. God, you've given us all, all that we need to do it. And if we do it, we know that our life will be full. It'll be complete. It'll be strong. Lord, help us in those moments. We know that you will. Your Holy Spirit convicts us when we do fall short, when, we, when, we, when we're playing around, Lord, in things. And so I just ask, God, that, we res- that you'd help us to respond to you and know that you're good and that you're awesome. First Christians in here, may we do that. May we, may we not let this world drag us down. Maybe that's a word for us, to know that this world is fading, but you're not fading. You have a beautiful promise for us. That we get to be with you forever, where we get to experience your grace and your kindness over and over and over again. Where we get to rest in your love continually and experience, feel it even. Help us to look forward to that day, but help us to press on with our eyes set upon you now. And I do pray, if anyone doesn't know you today, God, that they would come, and, and even if some seeds were planted, and just some, some truth of, maybe the question of, what am I doing what I'm doing? What am I living for? They would know that they, have, they, they can have purpose, real meaning in life. And so with a relationship with you, that's what it's about, a relationship with you. Knowing that you've done it all, for us and that we get to reap all the benefits of just being in you belonging to you so deepen us Lord and I pray Lord again if, if someone doesn't know you that they would just they take that step of faith for you and truly give you their life so much better it's a promise that we get to live forever and that we be, get to become children of God so bless this church Lord bless each person in here who, who need who just gets that refreshed mindset, Lord, today, that you have so much more than this world can offer. Help help us to be bold as we walk in you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Will you please stand? Let's sing to our God who deserves all our praise. God bless you.